On this day, exactly 99 years ago, the World War I Treaty, dealing with the Hungarian half of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Treaty of Trianon, came into effect. This video is sponsored by World of Tanks, which is giving new players some extra benefits to play around with, but more on that later. Before watching this video, I suggest you watch my previous two videos on the breakup of Austria-Hungary and the Treaty of Saint Germain. Also, before we talk about the main events, I want to have a few quick side notes about some extra things that happened during this time but don't connect well to the main story of the video. So the area in the East Carpathian Mountain and a bit south of it, mostly populated by Slavic-speaking Rusin people, is today known as Ruthenia. During the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Rusins didn't just stand idly by, and in fact, they formed several councils to try to figure out what should be the future for Ruthenia. First was the Council in Preshov, which was at the beginning divided among people wanting to unite with Czechoslovakia or with Russia. But at the time, they were unaware of the whole scope of the actual civil war happening in Russia, and when they became became aware of it, the council fully decided to unite with Czechoslovakia. The second council was in Uzhorod. This council decided on trying to push for self-autonomy within the new state of Hungary. The last two councils were in Maramara Siget and Yasinia. Both of these councils initially wanted to unite with Ukraine, but when it became clear that wouldn't be possible due to the Ukrainian defeat by the Bolsheviks and the Poles, the Maramara Siget council agreed to unifying with Czechoslovakia, all while the Yasinia council declared independence, proclaiming the Hutsul Republic. As post-war negotiations dragged on and it started to become clear that Karoli's government in Hungary wasn't going to give a lot of autonomy to Ruthenia, the council in Uzhorod also agreed on unifying with Czechoslovakia. So the last holdout at this point was the Hutsul Republic, which overall governed only around 20,000 people and existed only thanks to the help of troops from the WPR. So when the WPR ended in 1919, they also had no choice but to accept unification with Czechoslovakia. The Presho Council during these negotiations also unified with the Lemko Rusin Council, which declared independence in southern Poland and hoped for unification with Czechoslovakia. Their argument being that rather than remaining in Poland, they wanted to join the country which many of their brothers in Ruthenia have decided to join as well. However, the Lemko Rusin Republic got conquered by the Poles and Czechoslovakia didn't want to stir up any more problems with Poland after the whole war over Cieszyn. So the Lemko Rusin Republic wasn't allowed to join Czechoslovakia along with its brothers in Ruthenia. In the end, outside of a few few disgruntled Rusins, most of Ruthenia joined Czechoslovakia willingly, hoping to benefit from the strong post-war economy of Czechoslovakia and gain more autonomy than it had under the Hungarians. Whether this will happen is a story for another time. We also have to talk about southern Hungary. Here not as much happened as elsewhere within the crumbling empire, mostly because actual allied troops were stationed in Serbia since that's where the front ended in 1918. Plus Hungary already going into the Belgrade negotiations gave up any any idea of trying to retain control over Croatia and parts of Slovenia, so there was no major fighting there. But all this is not to say that nothing happened. For one, Yugoslav troops overstepped their demarcation lines, occupying border towns like Pech that were supposed to remain demilitarized by both sides. Then there was the Banat Republic that was declared in the confusion of the breakup of Austria-Hungary. However, this republic, even though officially ending on February 20th, 1919, didn't really have much power since the Allied occupation of the area in November 1918. There was also the Serbian-Hungarian Baranaya Baja Republic centered around Pech that was established 14th of August 1921 when Yugoslav troops withdrew from the area, but it only lasted for six days before Horti came in and took control. Those were my extra side notes, now back to Hungary. By January 1919, when the Paris Peace Conference started, every single Hungarian was furious. Because on top of having no coal for the winter, as Czechoslovakia blocked coal shipments to Hungary, there were also food shortages, uncontrollable inflation, shrinking economy, etc. By some accounts, people said that the year after the war was worse than the years during the actual war. But despite all of this, nothing made the Hungarians more furious than the high loss of land they have suffered under the Allied occupation demands. This was then further exacerbated by the fact that in the following months of early 1919, the Romanian and Czechoslovak demarcation lines continued to be pushed further and further into Hungary. These demarcation changes were sometimes purely as a further land grab by the neighboring nations, or sometimes because 
because the French or British Allied commanders felt a strategically important railroad track or a valley up ahead was a better defensible position. Hungary again had no choice but to concede to these new lines being established. With all this happening, almost every Hungarian started blaming Karoli and his government for the major loss of land. In fact, Karoli is still blamed by Hungarians today for this entire situation, pointing to his pacifist attitude, premature demilitarization and the fact that he sought out the separate armistice agreement in Belgrade as the major points of his failure. However, that is completely unfair. The Allies already promised land to the neighboring nations of Hungary during the war, so no matter if the Belgrade armistice happened or not, the partition of Hungary would have happened either way, most likely exactly the same way it did. Plus, Hungary lost the war. They were in no position to resist any Allied demands slash occupation. If Karoli wouldn't have disbanded the army early on, as he did, and would have tried to confront the Allied demands with it, it would only lead to further unnecessary Hungarian deaths, with the outcome being exactly the same, maybe even worse. No matter who was in charge of Hungary during that time, the outcome would have been the same because the main factors wouldn't have changed. Hungary lost the war, allies promised land to the neighboring nations, and minorities across the country rose up, establishing independent administrations. There's no changing that. However, such thinking was outright non-existent among the Hungarian people in 1919. The thinking that did prevail was that Hungary lost two-thirds of its land and something had to be done about it. So when Karoli's government received yet another letter from Paris that increased the Romanian demarcation line roughly to the area of where today's borders between Hungary and Romania are, he along with his government refused to accept it because they couldn't accept it without another major revolution happening in Hungary. So they instead resigned in late March, creating a power vacuum. A power vacuum which a man sent by Lenin, Bela Kun, along with his communist supporters, quickly took advantage of in a pretty much bloodless coup, forming the Hungarian Soviet Republic. Also at this point, due to the government change in Hungary, the Paris peace negotiations dealing with Hungary were put on hold. The Hungarian Soviet Republic was universally welcomed by all Hungarians, not just the proletariat. This was because the main stated goal of the communists was to regain control over all of the lost land, a sentiment which was shared by all Hungarian people regardless of their political views. The communists quickly started rearming and planning to first reconquer Transylvania before turning to Slovakia. Also during this time, even though the coup was bloodless, sadly the same cannot be said about the regime itself, which in endorsed many killings of people who were deemed anti-communists. They also supported attacks on minorities still living within Hungary. These killings became to be known as the Red Terror in Hungary. While this was happening, Romania asked the Allies for a permission to depose the new communist government. But to the dismay of the Romanians, the Allies decided to play it safe and before doing anything, asked Kuhn to adhere to the same demarcation lines that made Karoli's government resign. Kuhn obviously declined and so everyone started preparing for war. Again. On the 15th of April, Hungarians launched an unsuccessful preemptive attack on the Romanians who then followed up with a counterattack. After some heavy fighting, the Romanians were able to break the Hungarian lines and against the protest of the Allies pushed into Hungary all the way to the Tisza River. Here the communists were finally able to hold them. During the continuation of the Hungarian-Romanian war, Hungarians were hoping for a large Soviet attack on the Romanian-controlled Bessarabia, but considering the Soviets were preoccupied fighting the Ukrainians, Poles and white Russians, no major attack came and the smaller ones that did come were repelled by the Romanians. On the 20th of May 1919, with the Tisza line holding, the Hungarians started a new offensive into Slovakia, successfully pushing back the unprepared Czechoslovak forces. The Romanians tried a counterattack from the east to preserve a land connection with Czechoslovakia, but this was successfully repelled by the Hungarians who eventually split the connection between the two countries, while gaining control over much of southeastern in Slovakia by the 16th of June. On that same day, Hungarians proclaimed the formation of the Slovak Soviet Republic, which was meant to be a communist puppet state of Hungary. This was done mostly to try to get the support of Slovak communists and nationalists hoping for independent Slovakia. However, this backfired tremendously, with not many Slovaks supporting the state and many Hungarians despising its very existence as they thought the Hungarian communists would bring all the former lands directly under Hungarian control 
not create communist puppet states. Due to this, the communist control over Hungary started wavering, losing support from most people other than the proletariats and major cities. Large desertions also started to happen within the Hungarian army and soon the Slovak Soviet Republic fell as the Hungarians were pushed out of Czechoslovakia. Also during this time, Yugoslavian forces occupied more of southern Hungary. In late July 1919, a last ditch offensive was conducted by the Hungarians trying to break the Romanian Tisa line. This proved to be unsuccessful and the Romanians counterattacked with the goal of reaching Budapest, which they did the 3rd of August, ending the Hungarian Soviet Republic. What followed next was a complicated set of diplomatic and political negotiations between the multiple counter-revolutionary rightist administrations and the Allies, all while a largely Romanian occupation of most of Hungary outside of the Balaton area took place. The Romanian occupation wasn't civil, and the Romanians looted pretty much anything from large mechanical industrial installations to train engines, cattle, horses, etc. Basically anything that could benefit the post-war Romanian state. It was during this political uncertainty that a former admiral of the Austro-Hungarian Navy, Miklos Horti, started to gain a very strong power base in the Balaton area. He helped form and became the military leader of the new Hungarian army and once Romanians, due to an order from the Allies, withdrew from Budapest, Horti along with his army entered the city 16th of November 1919. Eventually, from all this instability and after a lot of negotiating with the Allies, a monarchist government was able to get into power re establishing the Kingdom of Hungary. The problem was, even though the Allies were at this point willing to tolerate the new monarchist government over the communist one, they still were firmly against any return of a Habsburg rule in Central Europe. So the monarchist government did the second best thing they could, and elected a universally liked war hero, Horti, who also had control over the country's military, as the regent to the Kingdom of Hungary in March of 1920. Also during this time, reprisal attacks for the Red Terror started to be conducted by fascist members operating within Horti's army and the new monarchist government. These killings became to be known as the White Terror and they reached a far bigger high than death toll than the Red Terror attacks ever did. Targets included former communists, Jews and intellectuals deemed to be too much on the left. To what extent Horti was involved or knew about these killings is a matter of debate and a far beyond the scope of this video. But now, finally with a new government in Hungary that wasn't in an active war with the Allies, the peace negotiations in Paris that dealt with Hungary could resume. As you would imagine, most of the Allies were pretty fed up with Hungary at this point. Not only did they actively try to go against the post-war terms imposed on them, but they formed the Soviet Republic and engaged in another war against the Allies. Therefore, the Hungarian delegation in Paris didn't really have much goodwill during the drafting of the peace treaty and pretty much had to sign anything the Allies gave them. When it comes to the peace negotiations themselves, the most cited point today is the use of the 19th and ethnic census. However, just like with the Austrian map, this map doesn't show ethnic boundaries. The Hungarian 1910 census only asked for a person's native language. From this data, it was then assumed that one's native language defined also their ethnicity and so an ethnic map was made. Now, asking for someone's native language is still a better strategy to define one's ethnicity than asking for an Umgangssprache, but it isn't perfect. For example, 65% of German speakers in today's Slovakia spoke a second language natively, and there were many native bilingual or even trilingual people in the kingdom. Therefore, people like let's say natively bilingual Romanians sometimes reported Hungarian as their native language since that was the main language of the kingdom even though they considered themselves as Romanian, not Hungarian. However, this discrepancy isn't huge, like some Romanian or Slovak nationalists would have you believe, and this map is largely accurate if we try to use it to define ethnic boundaries, even though the map itself shows people's self-identified native language, not ethnicity. Another thing to watch out for is that this map, even though very detailed, shows just the majority native language in an area. The fact that a random province in Transylvania has a majority Romanian-speaking population doesn't mean there were no Hungarians living there. Therefore, this map, which does look weird, is actually a better representation of the native language divisions in the kingdom. But such a map is hard to use on a geographical scale, so let's go back to the other one. When looking at this map, few things come to light. 
One is that it's obviously impossible to draw borders in such a way that there wouldn't be any people living outside of their country. Two, if you roughly averaged it out, borders of New Hungary should look somewhat like this, if you go by ethnicity as a deciding factor. However, the borders of Hungary ended up looking like this. This was because the ethnicity was a factor in the peace negotiations, but not the only factor, as many people make it out to be. As stated before, Hungary was far from a favorable place in the negotiations, and the Allies wanted to make sure that it would never unify with Austria or be able to attack its neighboring nations like it did a year prior. This meant that land, which had Hungarian majority but was strategically important, like for example the Shatmar Nemeti Nadivara the Narad railway lines, were given to Romania despite having a Hungarian majority population. Same thing with the South Slovak railway line, or even the very valuable control over the Danube River, effectively making Hungary weaker while strengthening the new Entente allies in Central Europe. The statement from the French Prime Minister Clemenceau summarizes the Allied intent with the Treaty of Trianon and Saint Germain. Our firmest guarantee against German and Soviet aggression is that behind Germany. In an excellent strategic position stand Czechoslovakia, Poland and Romania. So the new allied nations like Czechoslovakia, Poland, Romania and Yugoslavia were not only given very favorable peace deals because they fought on the allied side, but also because the allies thought if these new nations were strong enough they would act as a deterrent against German, Austrian, Hungarian and now the new enemy, Soviet aggression. And so the Hungarians were forced to sign a very unfavorable peace treaty on the 4th of June in the Grand Trianon on Palace and Versailles. It would actually take a couple of years and few revisions before all the particulars of the treaty would be in effect, but for all intents and purposes, this was the treaty that defined, with few exceptions, the borders of modern Hungary. However, breaking up a centuries-old empire doesn't only present an ethnic issue, but also a giant economic one. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was one country, and its industrial infrastructure reflected this. Due to completely new borders in Central Europe, domestic trade became foreign trade and many factories were cut off from their raw supplies. For example, spinning mills remained in Austria while weaving mills in Czechoslovakia. The grain mills in Budapest, at the time one of the largest in Europe, after the breakup had to operate only on 20% capacity due to insufficient grain supply. And even then, post-war Hungary still produced 50% more agricultural goods than it needed since its industry was focused on being the breadbasket of the old empire. By 1925, the trade of common goods in Central Europe fell by 54% when compared to 1950. 14, and that is with the inclusion of Austro-Hungarian internal trade of common goods during that time. The economies of these countries would eventually recover, especially in Czechoslovakia that inherited 75% of the empire's industrial capacity, and in Austria, which had the highest infrastructure development standards of living and education in the former empire, and therefore was able to by 1929 have the highest GDP per capita from all the former countries of Austria-Hungary. But with all that said, despite the recovery, the setbacks of the division of the empire were ever present in all the former countries' economies. In the end, in the age of nationalism, Austria-Hungary tried to run a multicultural empire that refused to reform. As such, its breakup at the first sign of major instability, which came during the Great War, was inevitable. What people grumble about to this day is whether the way the breakup happened was fair or not which really depends on who you ask. But in the end, a hundred years later, it doesn't matter, because we have the EU now, another multicultural country. However, hopefully this time we can overcome our idiotic tribalistic tendencies and hold together. But on a totally different topic, did you know that an Austro-Hungarian engineer named Gunther Burstein in 1911 proposed to the Austro-Hungarian military to build his design of arguably the first ever tank, which he called Motorkeschut, literally meaning motor gun? However, the Austro-Hungarian military declined his proposal and so Austria-Hungary wasn't the first country to build a modern tank. But that shouldn't stop you from playing around in some tank battles in the World of Tanks video game. The World of Tanks is a free-to-play online game where you can take command of a variety of tanks and battle it out with friends and foe alike in over 40 different battle arenas. 
These battles don't only test your mechanical skills, pun intended, but also your strategic ones, so come prepared. If this sounds like a game for you and you're a new player, before you rush off and make your new account, use the code TANKTASTIC or click the link in the description of this video to get an extra T127 tank, 500 gold and 7 days of premium access. So what are you waiting for? Join this massive community of online gamers and show them your strategic intellect. That is where I will conclude my video. As always, I'm aware that there are so many more things I didn't have time to talk about, like Vix's mission in Hungary or Horti's ascendance to political prominence, but the video can only be so long. This video also concludes my trilogy on the breakup of Austria-Hungary. I hope you enjoyed it and learned some new and interesting things from it. Lastly, this video was made possible thanks to my amazing patrons, thank you to all of you. As always, my name is Emlazer and stick around for history.